So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. There are two memories of Yankee Stadium that I hold near and dear. The first dates back to 1967. I was six years old, and my grandfather took me to the house that Ruth built for the first time to see my idol, Mickey Mantle. There are two things I remember about that night. The Mick hit a home run, but I was mostly scared to death being way up high in the upper deck. My second memory is of the last time I was at the stadium, June 16, 1997. Boy, that was a long time ago. Um, (laughs) My wife ordered tickets for us to see the first ever interleague game that counted between the Yankees and their crosstown rival, the Mets. We flew up from Florida just for the game. By then, I was more a Mets fan than a Yankees fan, to be honest, and even more so a Tampa Bay Rays fan, now my, my adopted hometown and my hometown team. But that, that game, that crosstown game, was as electric an atmosphere as I could imagine any World Series game might offer. But my recollections are just a drop in the bucket compared with the ones collected by Harvey Frommer in his new coffee table book, Remembering Yankee Stadium. It's packed not just with oral histories collected from some of the greatest Yankees players, managers, sports writers, and fans, but it's also filled with some awesome photos from decades of historic moments. Harvey, welcome to Mr. Media. Uh, Bob, it's a pleasure being on your show, but I don't think of uh, St. Petersburg as the baseball capital of the world, not just yet. Hmm, let me think a minute. Uh, since you brought it up that way, uh, where where will the Yankees be playing in three weeks, Harvey? Nowhere. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> it it may be the baseball capital of the world for a little while. That's, you got you got to leave the door open for that. Right. We'll agree on that. But I'm proud of what the guys are doing down there. You're 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 sad. I'm proud. Proud. Oh, proud. Proud. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> We're very proud of them down here too. It's a good uh, thing for baseball. As a matter of fact, you know, since we this wasn't where I was going to start, but since we are talking about that, um, I noticed something really interesting in the book uh, about an hour ago. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation down here about how uh, the Rays are, uh, you know, uh, they're they're in the playoff chase for the first time. They've had a, a remarkable season, a remarkable turnaround. But people are talking about how the attendance hasn't lived up to their their play. And I thought it was real interesting. Um, I was looking at the opening page of the chapter in the book about the Yankees in the 50s. And uh, as you do in here, you have the uh, attendance figures for Yankee Stadium uh, year to year. And I was fascinated to read the, um, I'm trying to turn to the page here while I'm talking, uh, the, the, um, the attendance for the Yankees, they won in, in the 50s, they, they were in first place Eight out of ten times, and they won. They were world champions six times, but their their average attendance was about 1.5 million. Now, you know, it's 50 years. We're 50 years separated from then, but the Rays will wind up with about a 1.7 million, uh, which is up about 400,000 from the previous year. And I thought, you know, considering the difference in the markets and the appeal of the team, maybe 1.7 million is not such a bad year after all. Uh, you're right, but they didn't have shows back then like yours and others to really uh, speak about the various teams and their doings, and I think that was really probably one of the reasons that we could attribute to the closeness of uh, 2008 Rays and, and uh, the 1950, whatever year it was, Yankees. But it is close. It's a very interesting point and something to ponder. Yeah, we also don't have the uh, – I mean, in the 1950s, they didn't have the preponderance of uh, – uh, televised games or the quality of televised games. Uh, and you know, there was so you also had only up. eight teams in each league and 154 game schedule, and right. uh, you didn't go deep into playoff time, you know, building figures up either. So a lot of different things, but, but still, there's a closeness that you point out. Yeah, I try to, you know, you try to, you try to be a homer when you have to, you know. <laughs> So listen, uh, I, I mentioned two of my favorite moments uh, from Yankee Stadium. Uh, I assume that 
the, the guy who writes a book called Remembering Yankee Stadium has got to have at least one, if not a few. What, what are your favorite moments, personally? Uh, well, <clears throat> people have been calling the book the definitive book, and they also call me a guy who knows more about the Yankees and Yankee Stadium than any uh, person uh, around nowadays. Uh, I'm proud of both of those claims. I didn't make them. I have uh, all kinds of uh, moments. I started going to Yankee games back in the 1950s, and I guess my real favorite moments were kind of professional moments. Uh, the opportunity to interview Bob Shepard when I worked for Yankees magazine for 18 years, <clears throat> sitting in the booth with him and being very nervous because he was announcing players and their numbers as the game moves forward, and I told him, you know, I really don't want to distract you. He said, oh, no, I've done this so long that I can continue <laughs> doing it no matter what goes on. I even read a book from time to time. And that was oh, one gosh. great moment. And my whole Yankee Stadium uh, imagery is colored by the voice of the great, great Bob Shepard. I was really privileged uh, not only to meet him then, to do a story on him, but then to interview him for this book where he is part of the oral history that I recall, and also to have him uh, write the foreword. And it's the only book that has a foreword by Bob Shepard, so I'm privileged along that line. So that's part of my answer uh, to your question. Another uh, part of it is uh, basically uh, a negative memory, also a working memory, but a funny one. I was doing one of my books, and I went in to interview Billy Martin. We had set up an appointment and I came in, and there was a bottle near him, and he was smoking his pipe in the manager's office, and he said, you're here the wrong day. I said, no, we made the appointment for today. He said, no, no, you've got to get your life straight. You're here the wrong day. Tomorrow is when we set the appointment up. I said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. I came back tomorrow, the next day, and he said, you know, guys like you really got to know what you're doing if you want to make a living in this business. It's not today. And it wasn't yesterday, it's the day after tomorrow. I said, Billy, I could live without you in the book. So that's a Yankee <laughs> Stadium you know, memory that's very interesting, uh, a working memory. Another one is a Lou Pinella memory. <clears throat> I was interviewing him uh, in the locker room, and uh, I told him you know, that my daughter, uh, at that time she was a teenager, she's a great fan of yours. And I'm just wondering, I know it's against the rules of the press, could I get your autograph on this index card? He <laughs> said, for you, I'll get you a ball. He got a ball and he signed it to Jennifer. All best wishes. And she still has that baseball. So it's the personal stuff. You know, rather than seeing uh, Bobby Mercer hit a home run or the first game played by this particular player or Dave Rigetti's 4th of July no-hitter that's in the book uh, that, that I was uh, around for, uh, but it's all of these personal memories, and the book is like a tapestry. Um, I teach oral history and culture at Dartmouth College, and I train my students to try to look around for these gems, people that nobody speaks to, and try to be able to weave this together in a tapestry. And that's what I've attempted to do in uh, uh, Remembering Yankee Stadium. And as you said in the intro, I have all kinds of people in the book uh, and all of these people, you know, blend together to make this tapestry of Yankee Stadium. How, uh, Harvey, how did you decide whose memories you wanted to gather and whose you didn't? Well, one thing um, I'd like to make this part of the record, too, Bob, <laughs> is I was denied access by the New York Yankees, believe it or not, even though having written for the team for 18 years, done hundreds of articles on the Yankees, did, don't, having done eight books with Yankee content and having the reputation, you know, in a way as Mr. Yankee, uh, they said they were doing their own official book and they didn't want to cooperate with a competitive book. Wow. So that was, t uh, yeah, I said more than wow, but I did say wow, well <laughs> too. But you can imagine, you know, how I felt. Uh, but I think they helped me make this into a much better book than theirs ever could be because their book has, uh, I think, three pages on George Steinbrenner's office, like, like anybody <laughs> cares. And it's got Muhammad Ali talking about Yankee Stadium and a lot of other super celebrity types. Uh, mine has people that no one ever heard of, and that's how I really worked. I wanted to get into the uh, famed uh, broadcasters, famed authors, Yankee players, people who played at Yankee Stadium, etc., 
And this is the unofficial but the definitive book about Yankee Stadium. And way led on to way, I've got a couple of bat boys in the book. I got one, then I got another, and then I got another. And that forms one of the great trios in the book. I got Roger Kahn. The Yankees would never have thought of interviewing him. But he actually covered the Yankees for a couple of years for Sports Illustrated and other publications, even though he's associated as a Brooklyn Dodger writer. Uh, I got Lee Montvale, who uh, wrote the classic book on Ted Williams, but also had the Yankee Stadium memories having grown up in Connecticut. And I could go on and on with the various people. One of the most interesting ones who I sought out was the man who hit the last home run at Yankee Stadium before it became uh, emasculated, destroyed, and became the new Yankee Stadium in 1975. Uh, this guy is Duke Sims. I don't know if you recall reading about him when you went through no. the book, because there's so much there. Uh, Duke Sims joined the Yankees late in the 1973 uh, season, and he uh, was the third-string catcher. Thurman Munson was the first-string catcher, and there sure. was another catcher there. And Steinbrenner had told Munson to go home. It was the end of the season. They'd get past the last few days uh, without him. And Ralph Hawk was the manager then, and he came up to Sims and this other catcher. He said, I'm going to flip a coin. One of you guys has to catch this game. And at, naturally, it was Sims. And Sims didn't even realize it because he had come you know, over to the team late in the year that this was the last game at Yankee Stadium. And he had a home run in about the seventh inning. And that was the last home run hit at Yankee Stadium. And Sims knew it was the last game when, when the last out took place. These, these thousands and thousands of people came out onto the field trying to rip the field up and to steal anything that was there. And Sims told me I could have gotten home plate. I was right over it. You know, but I didn't <laughs> and uh, he was getting married. Uh, and he simply you know, dressed quickly and got out of there. But that's kind of a story, you know, the official book does not have and that I do have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, uh, you correct me here if, if my memory is faulty. The, the stadium closed down, I think, for two years while the, the Yankees played at uh, Shea Stadium, right? Right, and I could have gone into a whole new book or at least a whole chapter because there were people approaching me telling me that they wanted to tell, you, tell me what it was like being a Yankee fan at Shea Stadium, but I just have a couple of memories of that. Yeah, that was a weird time. I, I saw, I think, I I can't swear to it because it's been so long. I'm pretty sure that I saw one of the Yankee games at Shea. I, I know at that period of time I was more definitely more of a Mets fan and attended more, more Mets games. Um, yeah, I lived on Long Island then, so I was able to go to Shea Stadium and to watch Yankee games, but it was weird. Yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> Um, who surprised you in terms of people that were giving you uh, memories? Were there people? Maybe I was wondering, for example, if there were people that you knew who, you know, maybe you kind of asked them for their memories, you know, maybe as a courtesy, and then you know, maybe they they gave you something that you really weren't expecting. I think um, there weren't really surprises, but uh, some of them, now that the book is out, have complained to me via email or by phone call that you interviewed me for an hour and there's only two paragraphs in the book. And oh, wow, that, wow, wow. You know, so that's really <laughs> you know, an editorial uh, decision on, on my part. I said I couldn't put everything in, but at least you did make the book. Uh, there are a couple of people I interviewed who couldn't even make the book. Wow. Uh, it don't, not only is the writer who dis- determines things, but it's also uh, the editor who goes through the stuff, too. But I try sure. to honor everybody, at least give them a paragraph if they have been in the book. So I don't. I can't, nothing really comes to mind of somebody surprising me, but they were surprised uh, at the length of the stuff they have in the book. And uh, did you get to talk to a lot of uh, old timers, uh, Yankees uh, old yeah. timers? Well, what, one of the most interesting interviews of all was with a Yankee old timer who is now a hundred years old. Uh, his name is Bill Werba, W E R B E R. He's mm-hmm. in a, an assisted living home in the Carolinas right now still sharp as a tack, and uh, this guy, in 1927, was a 17-year-old Duke freshman baseball player who the Yankees were going to sign, and uh, he told me what it was like being there for a month just after school ended, 
uh, with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and uh, Mark, uh, Mark Koenig, and, and Tony Lazeri, and all of these other players, he would try to get some infield practice, and they would scream at him, um, cleaning up what they screamed, uh, get out of here, kid. He also would try to get some batting practice out in the outfield, try to catch a ball or two. Again, they would scream at him, get out of here, kid, you know, we don't want you here. And he told me, like a fly on the wall, what it really was like to be a... Uh, a person, you know, among this uh, team of great stars, I call it the greatest baseball team of all time, and I wrote a book on it called Five O'Clock Lightning, but that was uh, a coup and something special about the book. Uh, a, a guy who ultimately, when he graduated from Duke in 1930, then joined the Yankees, and he played for them for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed getting him and getting, you know, that material. I also have Rod Carew, <clears throat> again, not to knock the official book, but why not? They would never think of going after Rod Carew, the Baseball Hall of Famer, uh, the longtime Minnesota Twin and California Angel. He mm -hmm. grew up virtually around the corner from Yankee Stadium. He actually was tried out by the Minnesota Twins in Yankee Stadium uh, because they wanted to save some money and not have to fly him to Minnesota or someplace. So just he walked in there. And uh, Sam Mealy at that point in time was the Minnesota Twins manager. He saw Carew hit a couple of shots in batting practice, and he came running out. And again, I clean up the language, get that kid off the field. If the Yankees see him, they'll grab him and we'll be in trouble. And that's how Rod <laughs> Carew became a Minnesota Twin. So that's another kind of story uh, you know, that we have uh, in the book that I think uh, adds immeasurably to uh, the, the, the feel of it. Hey, I, I want to tell you, Harvey, uh, I'm not worried about your language, uh, so feel free to you know, be as colorful as the stories require. <laughs> and then an, another guy, uh, Sal Durante, uh, he was a truck driver from Brooklyn. Uh, when he caught the ball that Roger Maris hit for his 61st home run, now he lives in Staten Island, so he didn't move very far away. But I tracked him down. He wanted a fee for the interview. He talked to me, maybe we could do a book together. You know, I said, well, you only did that one thing. What else? He said, well, that was a big thing. It was amazing for me to hear from this guy uh, that he and his girlfriend, who became his wife later on, and another couple, they drove from Brooklyn uh, to Yankee Stadium and bought four tickets uh, to sit where they thought Maris would hit that 61st home run. And wow. the four seats were together, and when the shot came in, there was an entire crowd. But this guy was a tough guy from Brooklyn. He jumped, fell down, had the ball, and people were all over him. He said, and I used my effing elbows, and nobody got that <laughs> ball. And I got it. It was $5,000 reward in those days. Wow. Wow. I, you know, there's, I, I was just um, I'm thumbing through the book while we're talking. Uh, I saw this earlier, and I really like this. This is uh, something Whitey Ford said to you. If, you. if you'll pardon me, I'd like to read it. Sure, uh, this is uh, page 73, and if you're just joining us, this is from Harvey Frommer's uh, new book, Remembering Yankee Stadium. So Whitey Ford, he says, Out of high school, I pitched for the 34th Avenue Boys in Queens, and we ended up winning the New York City Sandlot Championship in 1946 at the Polo Grounds, right across the river from Yankee Stadium. Teams were bidding for my services. I signed at the stadium in the fall of 46 for $7,000. The Yankees were playing Philadelphia. Paul Critchell, the famous head of scouting, had me sitting in the front row there next to the dugout. I want you to meet somebody, Critchell said. He just came up from our Newark Bears farm team. He says, Larry Barra? This is Eddie Ford. And he says, that was how Yogi and I were first introduced to each other. I never thought I would be pitching to him through all those great times. So just for anybody who possibly doesn't know, this is Whitey Ford, the Eddie Ford of the story, being introduced to Yogi Berra, Larry Berra. I mean, that's, it's just, you know, it's a little tiny slice, but it's, it's, a, it's a very rich piece. And if I uh, may be allowed also to quote myself in the book, to, of course. To, to, <laughs> Bill, to Bill Werba, uh, who was one of my favorites. This is the hundred-year-old man. Uh, and if people have been listening, they remember my comments about him before. Now he says, I returned to the Yankees in 1930 with my degree from Duke completed. Now I was a real player, not the kid I was when I spent a month with the team in 1927. Before I had room downtown, but now I was living at the Concourse Plaza Hotel about two or three blocks up from the Yankee Stadium 
It was a very nice hotel where quite a few of the Yankees lived. I just walked to work. I recognized there was a camaraderie among the players. They played all kinds of jokes on each other. Lazeri and Ruth were fond of each other. Ruth would refer to Lazeri as the WAP or the Dago, even though he knew his name, but it was in fun. No animosity was ever evident. He called me Kid, which sounded like Keed. He called Jimmy Reese, who was Jewish, the Jew bastard, but they were good friends. Bill Bojangles Robinson, the noted tap dancer, was friendly with the babe, and he would come into the clubhouse, always dressed in a nice coat, and put on dancing exhibitions, and the players would all gather around him and would watch him and clap, and some would tap their feet. So to me, hearing that as, an, as a person doing the interview, uh, I could immediately know where it would go into the book, because I have some stuff on Negro League baseball teams playing at Yankee Stadium when the Yankees were away. So in the mind of the person creating the book, I then segue into on July 5th, 1930, Negro League teams played at Yankee Stadium for the first time. The New York Lincoln Giants and the Baltimore Black Sox split a doubleheader before 20,000. And then I segue into the oral history. Monty Irvin, the great Monty Irvin, the Hall of Famer, who played for the old New York Giants. Mm -hmm. In the 1930s and 1940s, Yankee Stadium was rented by the black Yankees of the Negro National League when the Yankees were on the road. Playing there as a member of the visiting New York Eagles, it was like being on hallowed ground. But we didn't get into the Yankee dressing rooms. We all had to dress together with the black Yankees and the visitors' dressing room. Mm. So that little uh, sequence going from um, one guy who was 100 years old, then into, flashing into 1930, what he's talking about, and then get Monty Irvin into it, is just a way of uh, editing, organizing. It's like uh, making a movie and just cutting and splicing, and then we put the, the photos with the images in to put it all together. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got a question for Harvey Frommer, author of Remembering Yankee Stadium, among many other Yankee books, uh, feel free to give us a call, 646-595-3135. And as always, I'll caution you that if you're not listening to us live on Friday, September 19th, 2008, you're not going to get very far with that phone call. Uh, you know, Harvey, as we're talking, I... I uh, I actually have another uh, Yankee Stadium memory of my own I'd like to share. And sure. uh, uh, the language is a little colorful, so uh, mm-hmm. if you're underage, uh, cover your ears, folks. So years ago, this would be in the mid-'80s, I was a uh, correspondent for the St. Petersburg Times down, down here in Florida, and I get a phone call uh, from a parent at a local high school, the Dunedin High School. And they call up and say, hey, our kids were performing, uh, our kids, it was called the Falconers, it was a, a chorus, a high school chorus. They were performing this morning, and uh, George Steinbrenner saw them and thought they were wonderful and invited them to come and sing uh, uh, the Star Spangled Banner uh, at Yankee Stadium uh, in April. And this was like November, December. I said, well, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, I, I followed up and, and did a little story on it. And sure enough, I got Steinbrenner on the phone. He said, oh, those kids were wonderful. I'm going to fly them all up. We're going to show them the town and, uh, you know, they're going to perform sometime in April. I said, well, that's great, you know. So, okay, so the story ran. And then come March, uh, I get a call back from the same parent. He says, you know, we never heard back from Steinbrenner. Uh, we don't, you know, so, you know, he said he was going to fly the kids up. They were all excited and nothing happened. So, I called Steinbrenner's office. I asked about it. They said, well, it's still in the works. Anyway, so it finally happens. I think it was in like May of that year. It was probably 84, 85. Uh, I happened to, it, by good luck, because the, the newspaper wouldn't send me on their dollar, I, have, I happened to be up visiting my, my, my family. So I, I, I contacted uh, the, the, the media folks at, at Yankee Stadium. I said, hey, these kids are going to be there this day. I, you know, I want to come over and, and uh, cover it for the paper. So uh, they said, sure, and I go. And I'd never been, they, I had never been to the stadium as a professional. You know, I'd been there as a fan when I was a kid, but had not been back, and certainly not to cover a game or anything. So they took great care of me, and they walked me down uh, into the tunnels, and we went through the clubhouse area and, and the long tunnels. And in the tunnels, I remember I met Dave Winfield, and yeah, it was very cool. It was all before the game. And uh, so they took me and said, okay, you can watch from here. 
And I realized here is I'm sitting in the Yankees dugout. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was very cool. And so the kids go out and they sing and I take my notes and I'm writing stuff down and they come off the field. And I realized I don't have an escort. I don't really know how to get back to where I need to be. And I thought, you know, this is such a special opportunity. I'm just going to milk it for all I can. So the Yankees have come out and they're taking, they're, they're, you know, they're fielding, they're, they're, they're taking, they're doing their pregame stuff. And I'm sitting on the bench. There's pretty much no one around because all the players are out on the field. Suddenly, this grizzled old guy comes over and he sits down next to me. He says, what are you doing in the dugout? I said, oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm with the St. Petersburg Times and I was writing about these kids uh, who were just out here. Mr. Steinbrenner brought them out. He says, no. He says, let me rephrase it. What the fuck are you doing in my dugout? Boy. Yogi Berra. <laughs> it was Yogi. Uh-huh. And I said, um, well, I, I guess uh, he says, you were just leaving, right? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving, so I had to find my way back to And uh, so, you know, that's my third. I, I, I forgot that earlier. That would be my third and final uh, Yankee Stadium moment. Yeah, I have a Steinbrenner story also, which is an interesting one. Uh, I was doing an interview with Robert Merrill, the guy who used to sing the national anthem at Yankee Stadium, sure. a great opera singer. And uh, he said, where should we do the interview? I said, you know, you pick it wherever you want. He said, let's go into George Steinbrenner's office. So we get into the hallowed grounds of George Steinbrenner's <laughs> office. I'm sitting on a leather couch with Robert Merrill, and the interview is going along really well. I had my, my boom box tape recorder at that moment in time. I think mm. it was the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And lo and behold, the door opens, and George St- Steinbrenner comes in. And he didn't say, uh, what the F, but he says, what the hell are you doing in my office? <laughs> I said, uh, what are you doing here? You're disturbing an interview. And he left. He said, oh, carry on. He said, but I want to make sure that you're in a good mood because Robert Merrill is one of my best friends. You must have a drink. What would you like? I said, I'll have a beer, bud, or something like that. He poured me a bud. So that was George Steinbrenner. And uh, it's too bad he's kind of out of it these days because I think that's part of the problem with the team today. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about that a little later, but since okay. you brought it up now, tell me, I mean, the Yankees didn't make the playoffs this year for, what, the first time in 11, 12 seasons? I think maybe 13, but for a long 13. time, yeah. And, and you're obviously a huge fan and, right. and right. a Yankee fan at that, so I assume you have to place the blame somewhere. So uh, who, who is it? I place the blame on Hank and Hal. I really do. do. Uh, because <clears throat> when they flew Joe Torrey down to Tampa, they made him an offer that he could refuse, and he did refuse it. <laughs> and the irony of all things right now is Torrey was probably going to be leading the, the, the uh, Dodgers with Manny into the playoffs. And, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, they could go very deep, and he could win a win- world championship. Stranger things have happened, whereas the other Joe, uh, I think, has a rigidity about him, Joe Girardi. Mm-hmm. And it seems that the, the, these players, who, it's, people used to criticize Torrey in New York, you know, for he doesn't do anything, you know, he doesn't seem to be doing the right moves, not, not a great manager, but I think he was one of the great managers because he, he gave these players, like a thoroughbred horse, their, their uh, lead, and, you know, they were relaxed, they did what they had to do, and it wasn't life and death every day. And I think a lot of tension has been around this team and Joe but Chamberlain, for example, uh, starter, reliever, reliever, starter, in, out, you know, uh, that's yeah. kind of spreads to other people on the team. So uh, I hopefully they'll do better, you know, next year. Also, they got old in many ways fast, and I think that's another problem that should have been anticipated. Well, they've, they've always, for, I mean, for years, they've always bought the best talent at, that was, you know, prime and ripe as opposed to, there haven't been a lot of a whole lot of players, right? That they they kind of developed from, you know, way down young and brought them along. They they usually yeah. go out and steal other players, other teams' True. talent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, I'm doing now the uh, book again. I may be jumping ahead in your uh, That's okay. game That's plan right. for me. <clears throat> I'm doing a sequel now to Remembering Yankee Stadium, the definitive book, to Remembering Fenway Park, the definitive book. And um, I've mm. done about 38 interviews on Fenway. And the difference in the Fenway organization, the Yankee organization these days, it's like a total reversal of form. The Red Sox fans 
I'm living now in New England in the mountains in New Hampshire, even though I'm a native New Yorker and I'm teaching at Dartmouth, but the people, when I first moved here 12 years ago when the Yankees were king and I wrote the book Red Sox versus Yankees, The Great Rivalry, when mm-hmm. July or June rolled around, the Red Sox fans up here, they were packing it in, the season's over, we'll never get to the Yankees. Mm-hmm. Now that whole mentality has been reversed. Uh, can we win another World Series? Because the Yankees have won no World Series in the 21st century, and the Red Sox have won two. Uh, the Red Sox have a lot of homegrown talent and more on the way. The Red Sox have kept Fenway Park. That's another interesting you know, aside and part of the whole equation of the book I wrote and the book I'm writing. Fenway Park, uh, when it was threatened uh, with extermination, uh, you had an organization called Save Fenway Park that came to be. When Yankee Stadium was threatened uh, with extermination, although I think they lied also, at the beginning of 2008, the announced plans in the New York Times were not to raise the current Yankee Stadium and turn it into a parking lot. The announced plans were the vision of putting a high school there, a baseball museum there, and all kinds of Yankee artifacts. Some, suddenly that changed. But that's a political issue which a lot of politicians in New York and elsewhere are really battling over using uh, public money to build the new stadium in part. But the Fenway uh, fandom rallied behind Fenway Park, uh, their shrine, their cathedral, their great ballpark, and they can't really get it beyond 40,000 capacity. That's about all they could ever squeeze in now, even with all the little changes they've made. And the seats are small. If you're in the middle of a road that seats 25 people, you've got to get up every time somebody wants to go to the bathroom. You know, it's an inconvenience. Yeah. You could be sitting behind a pole and only see the game through one eye. Uh, <laughs> right. But the game goes on. It's very uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable place in many ways, but they love it. So uh, Yankee Stadium, on the other hand, uh, could have, uh, in my opinion, you know, been re- uh, retained. Uh, they've now made a, they're making a smaller Yankee Stadium with higher ticket prices. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's one way or another, my book ends with commentary by uh, Roger Kahn, who feels that Yankee Stadium uh, should be going and the new one should be going up. You know, it's getting to be a tired old lady. It's not the original Yankee Stadium. It's the one that came after the refurbishment, and it really doesn't share that whole signature and footprint of the original Yankee Stadium. I interviewed Jim Bowden, who would never get into the official book. He probably can't even get into an old-timers game at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> right. <laughs> he said to me, it's a disgrace. This is public money that could have been spent on something much better, but it's being spent on a place you know, for people to drink wine and have their... Uh, sushi delivered to them, you know, at their seat. So somewhere in the middle is where I stand. But I do stand squarely with the Red Sox fans who have this treasure uh, that they're going to keep and that they're making better, you know, each season. I, since you mentioned Roger Kahn, I was standing by with a uh, Roger Kahn uh, memory uh, that's in your book. This is page 107. Uh, he says, I love this, because I, I love Casey Stengel. We flew back from Milwaukee after the Braves had taken uh, games four and five of the 1957 World Series. I was with uh, Casey Stengel at the stadium, and a TV guy put a microphone in his face and said, did your guys choke up out there? And Stengel said, do you choke up on that fucking microphone? And then he turned around and scratched his buttocks and kept talking. Stengel later said to me, we've got to put a stop to them terrible questions. When I said fuck, I ruined his audio. When I scratched my ass, I ruined his video. <laughs> this is great. This is great stuff, you know? Um, uh, yeah, it was much more vulgar, but we did clean it up, even though it's vulgar enough there. <laughs> and a few pages later, uh, has, again, we're quoting Roger Kahn. Uh, in the early years, Mantle was not that nice. He became nicer as he went along. Right. I was sports editor at Newsweek. They decided they wanted a cover story on him. The Yankees ordered him to cooperate, but he was militantly uncooperative. I spent two weeks knocking around a lot of the stadium with Mickey, and to all my questions, he gave grudging answers. During that time, he went on the Ed Sullivan show. That was like the Oprah of its time. Mm-hmm. Later, I asked him what he got for the appearance, $500. Only $500? Yeah, but I got to spend the night with Kim Novak. 
<laughs> and that was cleaned up because it goes on because uh, he then detailed to me uh, what what Mantle did with Kim Novak, but uh, it didn't make the book. Uh, now, now it's starting to sound a little like uh, Peter Gollenbach's book about Mantle, the the novel, the Mickey Mantle novel. Yeah, well, uh, Gollenbach might have had that full version in, in his book. <laughs> Probably so. Um, so uh, you've written uh, several Yankees-centric books. Were you surprised that to find things out about the stadium and the Yankees in this book that you didn't already know? Um, I learned all kinds of things in, in uh, doing uh, this book that, that I didn't know. As you, everybody, you know, learns doing research in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, finding out new material. But uh, there weren't that many surprises. Uh, it was first known as the Yankee Stadium. So that was something that I never knew, uh, that it, would, it was also going to be called Ruth Field at one point. And that, that's the second thing that I learned in doing uh, this particular book. So I don't know if those are earth-shattering revelations. Uh, also, the, the amount of time that it took to build the stadium, the amount of money, the cost of it, I guess back you know, in the old days, uh, people had more of a work ethic or something, but uh, that was a, a stunning uh, bit, bit of statistical data that came uh, to me. Uh, the fact that Negro League teams, that they had to sleep, or not sleep, but get dressed and use the visiting uh, clubhouse, and the Yankee clubhouse was kind of uh, taboo for them to stay in. It's kind of a sick thing to hear about, so I learned that also for the first time. But there were no, not that many surprises. The Duke Sims one, I knew he may have, he, he, that he was the last guy that hit a home run at the old Yankee Stadium, but I never knew the full story of how he actually you know, wound up being the guy picked to play uh, or to catch in that last game. Hmm. You know, one of the things that I, I love about the book is the, uh, the photos. You, you may reference them before, but... Um, it's really interesting. You know, people talk about you see aerial photos of Central Park in Manhattan, and uh, you know you can see it's just this emerald gem in the middle of you know the concrete city, the concrete jungle. But from certain angles, you 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 suddenly see that you know it, you can see a picture of Yankee Stadium, and all you see is the incredible facade uh, of the stadium, and it's that's amazing. But when you see it from an aerial perspective, uh, you suddenly realize that it is very much like Central Park, where it is. Um, at least I thought so. You have the, you know, again, this beautiful green grass, and it's surrounded by, you know, the field. I don't know. I, uh, you know, I'm not that poetic, I guess, but uh, it made quite an impression on me. I love those pictures. Right, well, John uh, McGraw, uh, who I quote in the book, thought that the Yankees were very stupid uh, to be building, you know, a Yankee stadium where they built it. He said that a ballpark had to be in Manhattan. Nobody would ever go up to the Bronx. He called that Goatville. <laughs> and basically, in the early years, I guess all the way through the 40s, perhaps into the 50s, <clears throat> it was surrounded by good neighborhoods and a lot going on. And as the book moves on, the surrounding area around the Yankee Stadium becomes uh, much you know, less uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have any favorites among the photos? I, I have one in particular for myself, but I, I wanted to ask well, you. Well, I love the cover shot very, very mm -hmm. much, don't you? Oh, yeah. The cover is just spectacular. Is that is that hand-colored, or is that an actual photo? Uh, I think they colorized it, and they okay. also made my name and Bob Shepard's name on the cover. They silverized it. And mm. it's a shot of guys with hats, as they wore in those days, Shot right. from the bleachers, <clears throat> looking out, and it's a World Series game, and the frieze of the facade stands out, and then the back cover is also phenomenal. Uh, they commercialized it. They put all of these wonderful blurbs about the book from Nolan Ryan and George Will and Regis Philbin, etc., about yeah. me and the book. But uh, that's a shot from the L, looking at the entrance to the old Yankee Stadium. So I think that was an incredible. Uh, photographic choice and then what do you think of the end papers the pages at the beginning before the oh, the tickets begins, the tickets yeah yeah those are great those are absolutely great I I love um, I mean in general 
I love all the wide shots where you see everybody uh, in the black and white photos, especially, and you see them in their hats and things like that. Yeah, me um, too. I love and, also the way the book opens. I didn't like it at first, uh, but it starts off not after the tickets. <clears throat> we have a sign that used to be in uh, the, the trains in New York City ball game today at the Yankee Stadium. Right, right. <laughs> and then you open it up, and you see um, Don Lawson throwing the last pitch, that classic shot, and Billy Martin behind him uh, at second base with his uh, glove hand on one knee and the other hand on bare hand on the other knee, and the pitch being released. You also then go through these pages, the double page spreads. You got a shot of Garrett crying. That was a July 4th, 1939 speech of the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Then you turn the page and you get another double page shot of uh, Mariano Rivera, real close up, having just delivered a pitch with his teeth gritted and that look on <laughs> his face. And then uh, the title page, remembering Yankee Stadium and oral and narrative history of the house that Ruth built. Harvey Fromer, and um, you have this double page shot. This is the aerial shot, I guess, that you mentioned mm -hmm. that you could That's look the down. Um, the 19th, it's a 1939 New York Yankees attended as a 1939 uh, World Champion. I guess it's 19, uh, it could be 1939 because they have some of the banners up there from that time. Then the title page is there, and then the next page, I guess this is what you mentioned before, the crowd shots. It seems yeah. like there's nothing but men, nothing but white men, or there there right. are other uh, races in there too. If you look closely, and uh, it's just a shot of the bleachers and the signs, Canada Dry, BVD, Drake's Cake, mm -hmm. and also the houses that looked in. Even though Jake Rupley, when he built the park, wanted to make it impenetrable to all human eyes aside from those of the aviators that would fly. But uh, then they have the Thomas Wolfe quote, and then the book opens with kind of like ticket stubs for each of the chapters. And then the great Bob Shepard is on page 18, a younger Bob Shepard. He's 97 now, and he begins, uh, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yankee Stadium. And then you have that wonderful intro that he writes, and then the book begins. So uh, they did a great job laying it out, and uh, it priced at $45, which is a bargain, but on Amazon you can get it for about $29. And if I hadn't <laughs> written the book, I would buy 10 of them myself. <laughs> hey, I'll do the plugs here. Thank you, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the picture, and I'm trying to find it while you were talking here. I don't know. I found it so easily before. I, 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 you know, I knew I should have marked it. It's, uh, it's DiMaggio. And he's he's uh, rubbing down his back. Oh, the bone, yeah. The it bone. Begins, what think, on earth is yeah, I that? I think it's the 1930s. Oh, the 1930s. okay. <clears throat> I think I it just, opens that chapter. That that's it. I I didn't go what far enough we, back. What page? Uh, it's uh, what is that? One. Uh, it's page 48. Right. Yeah. I know. Uh, what, what is that bone? Uh, do you know? It's a ham bone. Uh, they they used to use a bone. <laughs> And they would then, you know, make smooth out the uh, the handle or the bat or the trademark. It's an odd shot, that, isn't it? That is one of the crazy craziest shots I've ever seen re relative to baseball. And and for DiMaggio, who of course is, you know, the the image of uh, or tried to be the image of you know sophistication and quiet and solitude. And here he is with a bone in a hand bone in his hand, mm -hmm. rubbing down his bat. I just it was just the silliest thing. Yeah, but uh, uh, I guess that was part of what made it. It was before uh, pine tar rosin was used, I think. So this was a way for them to do something to their bats. Now, if the um, if the if the Yankees uh, did not cooperate with you on this book, what was the source of so many of these photos? Was it the newspapers? Uh, Associated Press was great. Uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame was great, and uh, a place called Photo Fest. Uh, which is a private company located in Manhattan, was great. And then I really struck a mother load. I, I reach about 5,000 people with my Froma sports net uh, that goes out with the reviews that I write of books and articles that I write about sports. And I sent out a blast to people to t tell them that I was starting to write this book. And somehow these three world-class baseball photo collectors came to me offering their photos for the book. 
And uh, I think that one with the DiMaggio and the Bone may have come from them. I'm definitely sure that uh, some of the real older ones came from them. So I had really an incredible amount of photos to choose from, and people sent in their own photos, but the book is done by Abrams, Stuart Tabori, and Chang. It's one of the classiest publishers of the world, mm-hmm. and the leading uh, publisher of these coffee table books. But so they, I was very disappointed. Some of those photos, which I loved, couldn't make the book because they only wanted to go for high-resolution photos, photos that would reproduce the way you see them in this book. We had plenty to choose from. There are 240 photos. I also got from Topps Baseball Cards permission to use up to 50 baseball cards, and I think they only used about eight, so that could have been more, uh, but they made that as their own artistic decision. And how about the shot, uh, remember the shot, George Must Go, the two kids wandering around, save the Yankees, George Must Go? Let me see. I, I, I don't remember seeing that one. Because I, I, I think I focused a lot of my attention on the earlier stuff. That's obviously more recent. Yeah, th- no, this is page 179. I'm looking. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, it's, oh how did I miss that? Yeah. Double page. It's hysterical. Kid. Yeah, two kids holding that up. So there's all kinds of shots and all kinds of formats uh, in the book. Back in 1961, in the 60s, we even have the guy who, who I quoted before who caught the Roger Maris uh, home run ball. Mm. So he was just uh, you know wonderful to have there. And on page 128, you were talking about uh, Mickey Mantle, who you, who you liked so much. Oh, yeah, that huge double truck. Here on 128, you see uh, Robert F. Kennedy... Oh, that, yeah, that's the one before the one I was looking at. Yeah, yeah Mickey Mantle, both uh, on the. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, they were you Very know that were and young. both in their prime right there. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, the, uh, Harvey, um, we're gonna um, gonna kind of uh, head for home right here ourselves. Um, I, I imagine that many people will get your book. And they'd be kind of flooded with their own memories as they're reading it. I mean, even as I was. I mean, I was starting to remember things I hadn't thought about in a while. Is, is there anywhere that they can add their recollections and you know, personal photos to yours, maybe online perhaps, to your site or uh, somewhere? Well, I'm sure there'll be another edition, and um, I'm sure it'll probably go into paper. So uh, if I could give an email, um, sure. I'd be gl- glad to then you know, hear from people. My email is harvey, H-A-R-V-E-Y, dot Fromer, F-R-O-M-M-E-R, at Dartmouth, D-A-R-T-M-O-U-T-H, dot E-D-U. So uh, maybe they can become part of another version of the book. Very good. And you mentioned that uh, you're now working on uh, remembering Fenway Park. Uh, That 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 email would be perfect for them to contribute to that book, because that book is just being uh, born right now. And uh, that will have <clears throat> memories similar to the ones in the Yankee Stadium, only about Fenway Park. Okay. Well, um, folks, make sure you check out Harvey Frommer's uh, website, which is, uh, unless, I'm, unless I'm mistaken, www.harvey, uh, H-A-R-V-E-Y, Frommer, F-R-O-M-M-E-R, sports.com, Harvey Frommer Sports. Dot com. And you can order his latest book, Remembering Yankee Stadium, from great bookstores everywhere, as well as Amazon.com and MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. And listen, you can meet Harvey, as I plan to, at a, a, a number of upcoming book festivals, including the St. Petersburg Times Festival of Reading on October 25th, 2008, right here in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida, where we hope to raise a pennant or two by the time Harvey gets here. Uh, so. I'll be there. <laughs> you, you can come visit here. We'll, we'll have it on loan from Yankee Stadium. Um, Harvey, uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, joining us today. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. Bob, it was my pleasure, and I'm looking forward to meeting you when I'm at the St. Petersburg uh, Book Fair, and I'm also going to be at the Miami Book Fair if there are any people around in Miami. And I think you have all these dates up on your website as well, don't you? Right, all the dates are there, uh, different places. I'll be in Borders in New York, etc. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, and and continued good luck with the books. And continued success with what you're doing, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Talk to you soon.
Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, folks, uh, for dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my conversations with the creators, stars, writers, and producers of The Cleaner, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, Heroes, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Army Wives, 24, The Big Bang Theory, Bad Santa, Tell Me You Love Me, The Dark Knight, Zits, Baby Blues, and on and on. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen to the show on Blog Talk Radio, DigitalJournal.com, Podcast Pickle, Vox.com, Folio, MediaFly.com, PodFeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Audio, coming soon to Kindles, and already on iTunes. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman, that's me, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you take a little piece of your day and share it with us. Come back real soon, and thanks. Bye, everybody.